Well, thank you and welcome everyone to this high day of entombment. Great to see everyone here once again and welcome to everyone in the Zoom world that's unable to be here today. So hopefully you're all hungry today, um, hungry for God's word that is. So what do you usually think of when this day of atonement usually comes? Do you dread it when this day comes? You're like, oh, I got to not eat, not drink. Am I going to make it until the sunset time? Do we feel specifically like hunger pains? You see, we celebrated all the other feast days before this day with food. Uh, we, and because of that, we didn't feel any hunger. We always ate well on those feast days. Usually we have some kind of uh, potluck or uh, lunch between the services. Um, but today, something's different where we are actually not eating. We are meant to feel some discomfort, which is fasting. You may experience maybe a headache if you didn't enter the fast right, like if you were like drinking some caffeine before the Day of Atonement came. But I want you to look today at this day differently than thinking like of hunger and thinking about you're thirsty. I want you to look at this day like a new beginning. Yeah, a new be beginning. Think about that. Because all the other prior feast days that we celebrated up until this day was about getting ready for a change that is coming to this world. You see, the Passover, as you know, symbolized when Christ was sacrificed for our sins. So his plan can be put into action. That's like putting the on, pushing the on button so you can get God's plan set into action. And then the Days of Living Bread, which is a feast, it's about us working on putting sin out of our lives. That's something that we have to go through the whole process as humans throughout our whole lives in order to achieve to be in God's kingdom. Pentecost, as we know, is about the giving of the Holy Spirit. God's giving the Holy Spirit to God's church. And then the last day we just celebrated, the last feast, was the trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, which pictures the return of Christ to the earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's going to have to put down a lot of rebellion at that time. And there's also going to be the resurrection of the saints who have fallen asleep. But do you know what? Even after Christ returns, there's still a problem here. The problem is that Satan is still here in this world. And real change can only take place to this world. A new beginning can only take place in this world for mankind only when Satan is put away. So let's see what um, Paul warned Timothy about the end times, why we need Satan to be put away. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll read verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 3, 3 verses 1 through 5 in the NIV, New International Version. And here's what Paul wrote. He said, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without loving, unforgiven, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. So in those five verses there, Paul basically said everything, everything that is wrong with our world today and what's especially happening more and more as we live now in the end times. For example, today you see people, talk about people loving themselves more, you see, well don't you see people today, basically as you see in the news media and around us are more narcissists. Do we see where people really don't care about other people? They may be walking on the street and see someone in need and not care about them. I'm sure you all have heard stories where someone may have been assaulted, but other people walk by and didn't lift a finger. If someone does lift a finger to help someone who's in need, it makes the news. Why? I guess because it's so unusual. You've probably also seen in today's world, more and more, and what knows always happen, where people have loved money so much, they loved it more than to help them, than helping themselves grow spiritually and mentally. They love money so much they're willing to defraud people out of money. I'm sure you've all heard of the Ponzi scheme. 
And maybe you were a victim of a Ponzi scheme at one time. Well, that's an example. So, uh, so we do see what Paul was predicting here in the last days would happen is going on right now, and it's getting worse and more out of control. Of course, at the end of that verse, Paul tells us to have nothing to do with those people, but we have to get to the root cause of what's causing all this. Jesus Christ said this about the world we're going to be living in in the last days. Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through 8. Matthew 26, 24, Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8 in the NIV. Jesus said, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus is using up to say about how in the end times there's going to be more wars, there's going to be more earthquakes, there will be more nations against nation in the end times. And this is only the beginning of what's going to happen for the God's kingdom to come to the earth. And we see that today going on I get over in the Middle East with Israel. You know, Israel got attacked by Hamas in Gaza, from Gaza. And now you see Israel had to expand their warfare into Hez against Hezbollah into Lebanon. We see other nations in Africa where they're at war. You see war going on in South America. You see wars all over the world right now. And Jesus is saying it's only going to get worse. But notice, he said, all these are the beginning of birth pains. So if that's the beginning of birth pains, it's going to get worse. It's obvious that we're going to need a new beginning here. So, in my lifetime, for example, I've seen a lot of a war in my generation. I was born like right after the Vietnam War ended. Um, it, I remember as a kid when the Marine barracks were blown up in Beirut. We saw that going on. We had the Persian Gulf War when I was in high school. And of course, 9-11 happened. And who can ever forget that if you were alive during that day? That was a dreadful day in our country. We also see why we need a new beginning in this world. And because in this country, we saw socially how things have gotten worse. In my lifetime, gay marriage was unheard of in the early part of my lifetime. No such thing of that back when I was in grade school or even high school or college. And then around 2006, when activists started pushing for um, gay marriage to be allowed, and then they challenged it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, until the U.S. Supreme Court eventually allowed the gay marriage to be allowed. So we see unnatural things starting to happen now in this world, what's going on. And this is because this is a world that is held captive by Satan. And until we get rid of Satan, until God gets rid of Satan, then this world is not ready for rulership by Christ. But God has promised us this day of freedom, freedom from the devil, that has deceived the whole world. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll read verses 12 through 17, in which it talks about Satan, the devil, and what's going to happen to him, and what, what he has done. Isaiah chapter 14, and verses 12 through 17. Isaiah writes, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, speaking about Lucifer, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly or the uttermost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So we see in those first few scriptures how that Lucifer, later known as Satan, wanted to be better than God. He had, he's the one who started all this bad um, vibe that he's now pushing humans with. But in verse 15, it goes on. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a wilderness? who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home. You see, it's a prophecy here that Satan's going to be overthrown, and when he's overthrown, the people in this world are going to say, 
It was this being right here, this spiritual being is the one who made our world so bad. This is the one who made people so bad. This is the one who kept us captive. And now he's going to be brought down low. He's going to be taken care of by God. And God is so serious about this day, about giving us a new beginning that we'll no longer be held captive by Satan, that he even made this day special in, in the, for his days in, um, in Leviticus. Let's read about the, day, uh, the um, Jubilee year. Leviticus chapter 25, and we'll read verse 8, 8 to 13 from the NIV. So I think we all have heard about the, the year of Jubilee. And did you ever notice when the year of Jubilee starts, what day it starts on? In verse 8, Leviticus 25, it says, Count off seven Sabbath days, Sabbath years, I mean, so seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years, and then have a trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. We're going to get back to that, why God wanted that trumpet to be sounded on the Day of Atonement. Verse 10, Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself and ha or harvest the untended vines for the jubilee and it is holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. So what we see in the year of Jubilee, this was such a great day, a great year. It only came down once, probably once in your lifetime. It only came down once every 50 years. And it fell on the Day of Atonement. Notice that on this Day of Atonement, in the year of Jubilee, liberty was proclaimed throughout the land. And this scripture, of course, is written on our Liberty Bell in Philadelphia um, because it was about a time when the colonists here in America were looking for independence from England. But this liberty is not liberty from a nation on this Day of Atonement. We're talking about liberty from Satan. And God explicitly, apparently, wanted every man and every woman to feel liberty on this day. So in the year of Jubilee, on the, on the Day of Atonement, if they lost their land because of some debts they had to settle, they would get it back. Everyone would return to their own land. And it's probably every 50 years because the, he probably wanted you or them to look forward to this day because it would only happen once in your life that you could probably remember. And God wants us to look forward to this Day of Atonement, forward to this time when Satan is going to be removed as the leader, as the king of this world. That's why God implemented the day of, Year of Jubilee, and this has a, it shows how we're supposed to look to the Day of Atonement when it actually happens, when Satan is removed. This is such, going to be a, such a big day when this happens. So are we anticipating this day with much anticipation? Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 16. We'll read two verses there, 20 through 22. Leviticus 16, 20 through 22. This is about the two goats that would have uh, on the Day of Atonement. And it says in verse 20, When Aaron has finished making the most holy place, the meeting tent, and the altar ready for service to the Lord, he will offer the living goat. He will put both his hands on the head of the living goat, which is symbolized as Satan. And he will confess over it all the sins and crimes of Israel. In this way, Aaron will put all the people's sins on the goat's head. Then he will send the goat away into the desert, and a man who has been appointed will lead the goat away. So the goat will carry on itself all the people's sins to a lonely place in the desert. And the man who leads the goat will let it loose there. So this is another scripture in the Bible that symbolizes that when Satan will be removed from the entire world. 
because he has influenced the whole world to sin ever since he introduced himself to Adam and Eve as a serpent and convinced them that they were not going to die, that they were already immortal. Even though it's impossible to have a mortal soul, as you know, because soul means by definition that you will die. So, when Christ returns to the earth after, at the Feast of Trumpets, one of his main tasks is going to re have to reconcile man back to God. And how is he going to do that? He's going to need to remove Satan. He's going to need to remove Satan's Wi-Fi network that has been used to influence everyone to sin against God. Revelations 20 and verses 1 through 3 talks about an angel coming down from heaven that will lock up Satan for the thousand years. And what a sight this is going to be. It makes you think back to Isaiah 14, where Isaiah wrote, when this happens, is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? Is this the man who made the world a wilderness, who overthrew its cities and will not let his captives go home? But finally, Satan's going to be locked up. He's going to be removed. And this part of Jesus' prophecy, Jesus Christ's prophecy, will be fulfilled from Matthew 6 and verse 35. Matthew 6, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we're not going to be hungry. We're not going to be spiritually hungry, spiritually thirsty. We're going to have Christ to, on the earth ruling. Satan's going to be gone. So let's not look at this day with dread. Don't look at this day as thinking, I just need to get through it. Look at this day as a day of a new beginning for all of mankind. The day of freedom. The day of jubilee when everyone will be free from the influence of Satan. The day when we will finally only have our influence from God. That day is, this day is needed so Christ can rule the earth. Which is coming up really quickly because right after the Day of Atonement is come the, the Feast of Tabernacles. So let's look forward to the new beginning. I wish you all a wonderful Feast of Tabernacles.